Come on, let's clap for beer. All right, final call for Gilbert Standen. Thank you. You're hiding on me. Let's clap for Gilbert. All right, so you're gonna be number two. All right, is everyone ready to hear some upscale talks? Awesome. You're actually second. You're second. Okay, so wait. So on the, yep, on the top. All right, our first speaker is Deb Nicholson. And Deb is going to talk to us tonight about FOSS Awakenings. All right, like this around your ears. Okay. So if you want to go ahead and. Like this? If you've seen the movie, or uh, you, this has some smile spoilers, is what I'm telling you. Hey! Oh, sorry. Now can you hear me? I'm not in control of that part. All right. So, just start again. Uh, that's the second slide. Anyway, so, uh, we're the Rebel Army. Sometimes we get tempted by the dark side. Uh, the First Order, we don't want to emulate them because, one, they never win. And then, two, they're evil. So we're going to look at some of their mistakes. Evil mistake number one, putting all your eggs in one basket. This is a terrible idea. Complete adherence to one technology, come hell or high water, you don't want to do that. This is a bad mistake. Uh, this is you know, why, the, why the rebels always win, right? <laughs> uh, here in the free and open source software community, we're a little bit more uh, similar than we are different. And so I think we can embrace lots of different technologies, but still get along and be nice, even if you know, some of us like mint for our armor, and some of us like GPO. Uh, this, I think, is bad. You never know what technology you might be using in the future. So I think you don't want to be slagging other people's projects, because we're all in it together. Like, you know, the, we're the rebel army. We're the good guys. Evil mistake number two is treating your team like they are the enemy. You do not want to do this. If you do this too much, you run out of team, and then you don't have anyone anymore. Uh, these guys should probably all be wearing red shirts, which I realize is the wrong franchise, but you know what I mean. Be nice to the newbies and the people who are doing the unglamorous tasks. This guy could be Kylo Ren for all we know. Actually, that would explain a lot, right? Um, but yeah, no one wants to clean that thing out. Um, also, uh, not being nice to your team, it's bad for morale, it's bad for loyalty. You want to let people go out, do their thing, maybe make mistakes. Not that not shooting people is a mistake, but you know what I mean. Like, it's a, anyway, evil mistake number three, the hive mind. This is a bad, bad thing for any project. Uh, like, oh, we must all come from the same place, wear the same outfits, be born in the same weird clone hatchery, etc. This does not lead to good development. Even if we could clone Linux kernel developers, we wouldn't want to, because diverse teams are smarter teams. There's research on it, I'm not, this is not that kind of talk where I'm gonna share research, but uh, trust me, diverse teams are smarter teams. They're better at finding bugs, they're better at finding security <laughs> vulnerabilities. <laughs> Whoever green-lighted this, this was not a diverse team, you know what I'm saying? Uh, maybe not even a very smart team. <laughs> so, uh, so diverse teams are better, uh, and letting people ask questions. Evil mistake number four is killing people when they ask questions. In our universe, it's illegal, but it's also a bad idea because then people don't ask questions and you don't learn things. Um, a more like hybrid approach might have been really good for the First Order. Somebody on their team probably said, like, hey, are we really going to build another ginormous, expensive spaceship with an external vulnerability that anyone can see from miles away? And then they got shot, so they did it. That person, uh, anyway, I'm not, I'm not trying to, you know, I'm not a fan of the First Order, I'm not saying that. Um, but, you know, maybe like bioweapons or like, you know, infiltrating rebel planets, they could have tried a few other approaches. Even sieges, which have been around since before we had buttons on our clothes, like just controlling the water and the, the food or something, you know, but nobody, nobody was able to ask those questions. The hive mind didn't allow it. So. Uh, you know, and then the questions don't even have to come from the present. They could come from the past. So uh, I don't know what they have for Wikipedia in the Star Wars universe, but there should be something. Um, in our universe, we have lots of folks with tons of institutional knowledge. You can hire them. Uh, evil mistake number five, 
is just being evil. Uh, it has got to suck to run the social media accounts for the first order, right? Like, hey, I saw you like killing people and taking orders. I have a total opportunity for you. Um, so try to be a force for good. Mentor new people. Give them, uh, you know, let them drive sometimes. Uh, mentoring, it doesn't always work, Kylo, but when it works, it's worth it. It's a really good thing. Uh, so just to recap, create a safe space for your community where they feel uh, they can ask questions, they can point out problems, they can say, I found a security vulnerability. Um, you know, it's going to help you recruit, it's going to help you have a happier project and everything. So, I hope you will help me in free software world domination uh, in this galaxy coming soon. And uh, may the FOSS be with you. Thank you. All right, thank you, Deb. All right, our next speaker is Gilbert Standen. We found him. Uh, so Gilbert is going to talk to us, to, uh, talk to us about uh, running Oracle in LXC on Ubuntu. Uh, hi. So I think this talk's probably going to really suck following that great act. It's kind of dry, but we'll try. So this is about building Oracle on LXC Linux containers on Ubuntu. When I talk to the Oracle people and say Ubuntu, they say, huh, what? When I talk to the Ubuntu people about Oracle, they say, huh, what? So I'm in this no man's land. Um, but uh, if you look at the performance data comparing Oracle in KVM with, uh, with all the virtual block data planes and you compare it to LXC Linux containers, there's really almost no comparison. Uh, the LXC containers have much lower latency, much higher throughput. Um, this slide has a little problem. Eventually these are going to pop in, but your major service providers like Google are all containerized, uh, as you most all of you probably already know. Uh, Facebook is heavily containerized, um, and Twitter heavily containerized. So um, when this slide advances, but the point here is that um, container is, containers, LXC containers, whatever container version you like, they haven't really filtered into the big enterprise yet. So there's a huge opportunity for everybody in this room to make a name for themselves putting LXC containers in the big enterprise. You know, your general electrics, I mean, if they'll listen. Um, and so, um, where is uh, Gareth? Gareth, <laughs> my, is there a way for me to make this slide advance? <laughs> yeah. Um, this, one, this is the one that seems to be stuck. Ah, there it goes. Thank you, Gareth. You did that by thinking somehow. So. Um, this is going to have the same problem, but uh, this is basically, there are some large hosting providers that are using, oh, <laughs> yeah, uh, Rackspace is heavily using containers. So anyway, here's our Oracle on LXC workflow. It's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, you build your containers on Ubuntu. You have a DNS DHCP integrated solution. Oh, <laughs> I'm not keeping up. Okay, this is just a slide showing um, how you put LXC on or open vSwitch. Um, you need these files to create the, the VETH pairs um, when you use open vSwitch with LXC. Hypervisors, we all know they have a lot of limitations. They're, they perform poorly. The virtualized hardware performs poorly. Um, with containers, uh, you're sharing one kernel. You're getting bare metal performance from your compute, your storage, and your network. And you have better manageability. <laughs> <laughs> Um, these are some graphs showing the, uh, the um, I feel like I'm being given the hook or something, but uh, <laughs> showing the, the performance advantages of LXC. You can see you got latency about a millisecond, and the KVM, um, you have to use a huge amount of memory compared to what you use for LXC to get the same kind of uh, order of magnitude latency in KVM, and that's because my tests have shown that KVM is using a lot of memory, uh, even with virtual block data plane. You can see how you get um, much better uh, um, IOPS in LXC uh, for the same system, 46,000 versus about 2,700 in KVM. Um, and the IBM did some of these same tests. Uh, some graphs here that show some, some throughput profiles, uh, 16 megabyte LXC. Um, and uh, so now this slide, okay. <laughs> 
So the, the uh, and then you can see the profile for, for uh, KVM is quite different. Uh, to be honest, I haven't entirely figured out uh, why these profiles are so different. Um, maybe somebody here probably sees it immediately. I don't. Feel free to shout out. Um, but very different. Uh, you have to give KVM, again, a lot of buffer cache. That's the Oracle buffer cache. That's the SGA that Oracle uses. Um, and I will just put in a commercial that, you know, I see no reason why Oracle shouldn't be run on Ubuntu. I think it's the best OS, and I think you know any database should be able to run on any OS. Um, some additional graphs on uh, read latency with the smaller buffer cache, LXC versus KVM. And then the convergence phenomenon, I really love this slide. Um, the great thing about using containers is that the container work you do on your desktop or laptop is almost identical to what you're going to do in the big enterprise. So when you build pilot systems on your desktop system, you don't have to use all kinds of artificial things like hypervisors and VMDKs and VDIs. Some of the major advantages, um, you know, the massive reduction in deployment time with containers, reduction in boot up time, uh, in performance improvements. And uh, there's an IBM research report that did a comparison of KVM versus um, LXC containers. And uh, they, they arrived at a lot the same results that containers are going to give you fantastic performance. So I, I think it's a, a, great, uh, a great revolution in, in the Linux space. And these are some references um, if you want to find out more about my work. And uh, I guess that's about it. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Gilbert. Thanks, Gary. Right. Our next speaker is Lucy Wyman, and she's going to talk to us about a GIF analysis. I'm going to be talking to you about GIFs. So uh, this is really just an analysis of the image format that we all know and love. So there are several different ways to pronounce the GIF. It's a topic of much debate. So there's hard G, soft G, GIF, all popular. Uh, the creators of the GIF stated that it's named after the peanut butter. So GIF is correct. And it has never been debated since they said that, obviously. Um, so, uh, graphical image format is obviously an image format. It includes 8-bit colors, animation, and LZW lossless compression. It was created by CompuServe in 1987 as an effort to improve upon the uh, image formats at the time. So, um, yeah. Oh, man. Uh, okay, so what makes a uh, GIF funny? So uh, GIFs are really, like, in a text-based internet, GIFs are a way to infuse human nuance and emotion into things. So context and then several types of humor make them funny. Uh, for example, this tweet is pretty funny, I think, but I showed it to my parents, and they were like, well, what? Um, <laughs> context is everything. Like, with any human interaction, uh, where it is uh, depends a lot on like, how people interpret it. So basically the rest of this presentation is going to be me showing you different GIFs, and then you laugh for 15 seconds, and then the slides advance, and then we're done. <laughs> so, um, so uh, for example, uh, David Tennant, I think, uh, really makes this uh, GIF. I got this in an email from a professor being like, oh, class is canceled. JK, I'm really happy. So, um, I think surreal humor <laughs> is also very well expressed in GIF form because it's so physical, right? Like, it's so easy to make a GIF that's like, wait, what am I even looking at? Um, and that can be really funny, such as Nocopus. Uh, parody also really shines in GIF format, so that's taking something from pop culture and then expanding upon it in a humorous way. 
For instance, Kanye cannot have all of that chowder. Um, irony is also uh, very well expressed in GIF form, uh, like taking uh, especially the image and then the text kind of turning it on its head or not quite being what you expect. So um, Emma Stone, don't let me become a diff and then she does, whoops. Uh, blue humor is also known as sexy humor. So um, those are the kind of gifs that make you go, ooh, um, and can also be. Uh, very funny if well done. If not well done, it's just kind of gross. Uh, physical comedy obviously <laughs> shines, <laughs> shines in GIFs. Uh, since, since it's really like uh, such a visual image format, um, like GIFs are great basically for physical comedy. There's also a category that I like to call cute humor. So in order to find this, I googled like cat, shark, Roomba, duck, and Google knew what I meant. Uh, dead cat humor is also uh, pretty funny. This, this one really just speaks for itself. I don't, I don't need this one. So hyperbole can also be really funny. Uh, similar to irony, it really needs to be well used in order to uh, come across, especially in a GIF. But um, yeah, sometimes going like just a little too far uh, can really make a joke. And then, <laughs> last but not least. The jokes we all love and hate at the same time, the puns. So, GIFs can be used to express human emotions in nuanced visual format in the web, and a lot of times can be really funny, because humans are funny, and emotions can be funny, and manatees can be funny. So, uh, that's pretty much, pretty much my talk. There's a few links I use to like, find out some information about stuff. If you, like Jim Carrey, want to click on them and look them up, feel free. All right, thank you, Lucy. All right, our next speaker is Don Marty. Don is going to talk to us about saving advertising. Yes, I'm, I'm going to be talking about uh, saving advertising in one line of JavaScript and why you might want to. Um, I guess I have too much time because it's one line of JavaScript. I'm not going to take uh, five minutes for one line of JavaScript. Um, so. Uh, let me ask, first of all, uh, who's running an ad blocker on their main browser right now? Okay. Uh, you with your, your hand down, what's the matter with you? Um, so, web advertising sucks your bandwidth, it uh, introduces malware risks, but really, advertising doesn't have to be like that. Uh, look at this book by uh, William Gibson. It's a great collection of short stories. If you haven't read Burning Chrome, pick up a copy. It, uh, uh, predates a lot of uh, what we now know about the internet. And, and this stuff was written in the 1980s, paid for um, by Omni Magazine. And in the magazine business, the uh, subscribers pay for printing and postage, and the advertisers, in this case Dungeons and Dragons, uh, the advertisers pay for the content. So if you like those, those stories, those cultural works, uh, you can thank uh, the uh, uh, TSR Hobbies people who paid for uh, advertising back then. Now, micropayments, prediction markets, uh, crowdfunding, those are all excellent and very promising ways to fund uh, content. If you can understand this math, I hope they'll make that kind of stuff work. But for now, yes, there are important cultural works that were paid for by advertising and we need to give advertising the power to pay for more of them. So this is where web advertising is today, right? Your computer is broadcasting an IP address. How do we get from all this great stuff that we had in pre-web media to that on the web? And that means we need to think about what is the economic purpose of advertising? Advertising is an exchange of economic signal for attention. 
a signal conveys the advertiser's intention of what they're going to do in the market. In Computer Shopper, you find out, well, should I invest in PCI or EISA? Those ads carry important market information. When IBM invested in Linux in 2000, they put a lot of the money into a big TV campaign. Why? To convey to a wide audience that the company is serious about a market and it's seriously worth paying attention to. Now, on the web though, that signal's lost. It's possible to watch people, give them a specific ad, it's no longer a costly signal of the advertiser's intentions. It's just spam now. As soon as advertising turns into a cold call, everyone in the audience has an incentive to block it. So what do we do about that? Well, EFF has this great little tool called Privacy Badger that will um, watch your browsing session for third-party sites that are trying to track you. And it will block those sites and keep them from, um, from making ads into a cold call. And this is a browser with Privacy Badger turned on. And the creepy little ads that follow you around and provide no value are gone. But these large, more magazine-style ads that you see on the next web are still there. And tracking protection tools are out there for all the common browsers. So you can get it for Firefox. You can get it for Google Chrome, even. Um, and users want more privacy. This is a tag from a jacket pocket. It says, RFID protected. Nobody buys a jacket that has a tag that says, RFID amplified to connect and share with your favorite brands. <laughs> users want privacy. As a webmaster, give them a notification, the little red box in the upper right-hand corner. Give them a notification when they're vulnerable to tracking. This is the Aludo script, which is uh, running a fake tracker. Uh, you can integrate a tracking protection warning into the design of a site and say, look, I ran this fake tracker. You seem to be vulnerable. Here's a fix that will protect you on the browser you happen to be using. You can even go a little over the top. You can catch somebody who's running in an unprotected state, and you can redirect them to another page that has a crappy ad on it and uh, no content for you message. It is completely up to you as the webmaster how you want to inform and nudge and reward readers to help fix advertising on the web. And there's the line of JavaScript. Thank you. All right, thank you, Don. Our next speaker is Emily Dunham. And Emily is going to tell us exactly where the cloud is. <laughs> OK, this is fun. Oh, yeah, I can hear me. My mic's working. Awesome. Um, so I'm E. Dunham on most of the media that matter. Q. E. Dunham on some of the ones that aren't. These talks are available at that URL. The same slide will be the last one in the presentation, too. So before we get going, by a quick show of hands, who here identifies as a real system administrator? A few of you, cool. So the rest of you look around, see who that is. You might want to ask him some questions later. Now, who here isn't really like a real sysadmin, but you have to wear the hat sometimes? <laughs> yeah? OK, that's cool. It probably seems pretty easy. You don't really have to worry about too many backups, about too much disaster recovery, because all of your stuff is being done in the cloud. Now, the cloud is this big buzzword that seems to mean a technological panacea. Just put it in the cloud, that'll fix the problem. What does cloud really mean? So, <laughs> there's a bunch of different kinds of clouds out there. We've got Cirrus clouds, we've got Alto Cumulus and Cumulonimbus. These just are a hugely wide variety for every use case. No, okay. Actually, there's the public cloud, where you basically rent some subset of somebody else's server functionality to do your computations. If you'd rather not do it on someone else's servers, you could use your own. You could have a private cloud, which is where you tell your servers to virtualize other servers. 
because you like servers. You put servers in your servers. And then when the servers break, the other servers will fix them. Sounds awesome on paper, right? But it isn't turtles all the way down. So your computations are actually getting done on transistors. Transistors live in chips. Chips live in servers. And servers live in data centers. So the internet as we know it is comprised of a bunch of computations that are done in these big old buildings. And the buildings need power, they need air conditioning, otherwise the servers will literally melt and or catch fire. And most importantly, they need to be held together by this network of fiber optic cables. The cables are owned by a variety of different interests. The functionality of the net depends on cooperation between those interests which is only a little less scary than ship anchors and bulldozers when you're talking about a bunch of wires, but it beats the alternative. You can get decent bandwidth <laughs> out of a box of hard drives in the mail or an SD card taped to a pigeon, but you know that the latency just cannot compare to throwing your packets around at the speed of light. So, now that we know what the cloud is, let's talk about where it is. I want you to just think to yourselves whether you have one server in one data center of any of these cloud hosting providers. I'm, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands. That would be a bit embarrassing. So here in AWS or equivalently Heroku, US West 1 and 2 are popular regions to deploy your servers into for developers in North America. They are also in an area that geologists identify as overdue for a massive catastrophic earthquake. If you're using Windows Azure, look at that line that the data centers make around the Pacific Rim. It's an area poetically described as the ring of fire based on the volcanoes and earthquakes that it tends to get. Okay, Pacific Ocean's scary. Let's not put our servers there. Maybe we could put them in Europe. So if you're doing your computation in the EU, you may, I'm not a lawyer, you may be legally exposing yourself to a variety of data retention laws. Let's just copy all the data, put it in all the different data centers. Um, there's this problem where you also have to be able to delete an individual user, everything about them, because of their right to be forgotten. So maybe putting our servers overseas isn't the best idea. Let's come right back here into a good old US where the unknowns about uh, national spying and stuff are basically known. Let's, um, let's put them in some place like Linode's Atlanta or Dallas data center, or Rackspace's Virginia, Dallas or Chicago data center. These actually map out an area known as Tornado Alley because of how often it gets massive, massive storms to take out the power for a while. It might not be that bad. Data centers have backup generators. They have redundant networking. They have enough fuel to last them a while. But uh, at the end of the day, your computations are being done in a building on the ground. So I hope after this quick tour around the world, your judgment about whether to tolerate a single point of failure in your infrastructure might be a little bit less clouded. All right, thank you, Emily. Our, our next speaker is Dave Nielsen, and Dave is going to talk to us about Redis functions. Hi, my name's Dave. I took a job at Redis Labs not too long ago and uh, learned that there's a heck of a lot more in Redis than I knew. And so now I'm doing uh, sort of my job, my, my um, role is to tell people about Redis. And I thought I'd ask you all, um, how many of you use Redis? Okay, how many of you um, know that Redis does more than caching? All right, so I'm going to tell the rest of you that it's more than just a cache. You can use that as a database, and you can uh, use it as a, uh, for message, as a message broker. And um, there's so many cool things it does. It's actually getting a lot of, becoming much more popular these days. And um, you can see here that it's um, number one in a whole bunch of cool and nifty categories. Uh, but the more important thing is to think of Redis as a data structure store. Okay, and that's what makes it really cool. And what do I mean by data structure store? Is um, uh, when you think of most databases, you think about them having, uh, you're gonna store your data in a table or a row, right? That's like one structure. But that's all you get. You get this row to store your data in. And 
um, with MongoDB, for example, you can store your JSON in there. By the way, I think this is stuck. So I don't know if somebody can do something, but it seems to be stuck on this. Not sure why. Maybe there's something in there. Anyway, OK. So <laughs> there, there's, um, there's a lot of really cool things in there you can do with Redis. And there's a lot of the high-flying companies out there that you've heard about um, are, are using Redis. And there are, because Redis is so open source, um, there's, there's a lot of people contributing to it and making it better and better and better. But like I said before, like the really cool thing about it is these data structures. And when you look inside of Redis, you will notice that it is full of all these cool structures. And that's basically what I want to talk to you about. Uh, this is from 2001 Space Odyssey. So here are the structures. We've got strings. We've got hashes. We've got lists. We've got sets. We've got sorted sets. We've got bit arrays. We've got hyper log logs. That's cool. And now with uh, the latest version, we've got geospatial indexes. And you can put all these data structures together with the functions, uh, kind of like Lego building blocks. So um, here's a few examples I want to run through. Session management, some uh, message queues, finding mutual friends, leaderboards, et cetera. And like I said, you combine these data structures with functions, and you can create uh, new um, types of or useful um, uh, functionality. So here we're talking about user sessions, and we're going to use the hash data structure. And it, all you do is you use a function called hset. And you can set the variables, uh, values in your session and store user information in memory, which you can very quickly retrieve. Or you can use HM set, and you can add a whole bunch of values into a session. And so it's very, very fast and easy to use and learn. Now here's another one. We've got uh, message queue. So let's say you want to you have a whole bunch of data coming in, and you want to put it and hold it somewhere until you are ready to use it. You can use L push, and it literally pushes it to the left side, I guess on the left side of the queue, and you keep adding items along in the queue. And then you can um, also add them to the right side of the queue if you want to push it to the very front. Uh, and you're basically building up this queue. And then what you can do is you can actually take that data, and you can move it to another queue. And guess what? We've got over 180 functions, including one called rpoplpush. All sorts of cool functions. And what that does is you're literally going to pop it from the right side of the first queue and push it to the left side of the next queue. And it all happens all on the server side, so you don't lose any data if anything crashes. Uh, here's another one called managing tags. So um, oh, the function's called sad. Well, anyway, it means basically to add to a set. And what's really cool about this is you can add a whole bunch of tags to something, like articles. And then when you want to find similar articles, you can use s inter to find the intersection of similar tags. And this will then show you all of the articles that are similar to the article you're reading. And uh, it's very easy to do, again, with just simple functions. Uh, here's one for leaderboards. So if you're creating a game, and uh, you want to be able to see in real time the scores. You know, scores are changing in real time with massively multiplayer online role-playing games. And so um, what Redis does is it automatically, as it's inserting an updated score, it's restructuring the list so that when people are reading it in real time, uh, they're reading just the list and they're not having to actually do a search or a sort. So it happens very fast. And again, you use Z add for a sorted set. Um, <clears throat> and uh, there's many of these functions. So and, and data structures. So I don't really have time to go into all of them, but I wanted to share a few of these with you. Uh, a couple of things I want to share with you about um, Redis. Oh, sorry, this slide didn't turn out very well. Um, a couple of things I want to share you, with you about Redis is uh, it's, it's a very liberal license. So it's, um, it's very, very open source. And you can like anybody can take it and use it and do really what you want with it. Um, and so you'll find it all over the place. It's kind of becoming ubiquitous. You'll find it on lots of different clouds. So you'll find it on Amazon. You'll find it on Google. You'll find it on Microsoft. You'll find it on uh, IBM software. And uh, again, it seems to have gotten stuck. Sorry, I'm not sure why. Um, and so, uh, oh, there may be some build on here. Mm, that's the problem. Sorry, thanks for doing that. Um, <clears throat> but it's also written incredibly well. It's written in C. Uh, a lot of people will tell you that if you want to learn about good C programming, go read the, the source of Redis, uh, and you'll, you'll notice that it's actually written very well. Um, and then, well, I guess we're done here. <laughs> but uh, 
come, come check out our booth and uh, I'll give you some free, free resources. So thank you very much. All right, thank you, Dave. Uh, our next speaker is Julie Gunderson, and Julie is going to talk about how she embraced her sparkle. Well, hello. As Garrett said, I'm Julie Gunderson, and I'm here to talk to you about how I embraced my sparkle. Uh, my slides aren't up here yet, but maybe they'll get here. So I'm here to talk to you about embracing my sparkle, how you can embrace your sparkle, and what being a DevOps princess means. And you might also get why we're all wearing tiaras out of this. So words have power. They have power over how we see ourselves. And uh, we use words every day to describe what we do. And that can become part of who we are. And so it's important to use the right words to describe ourselves. Two years ago, when I started at Taos, I did not come from an IT background. I came from a higher education background. And I saw myself as this princess, pr uh, Princess Toadstool from Super Mario 1. She was helpless. She had to be rescued by Mario after he killed King Koopa. That's how I saw myself, because I wasn't using the right words to describe myself. <laughs> I thought PowerShell was what we used in Mario Kart to beat our kids at the race, or what Bash is what you did to somebody that you didn't like. But because of the community, the community of people like you, I have been able to change the words to describe myself. And now I have a virtual machine to run Chef DK, and I've done a pull request. And that's all because of the community and changing the words that I used to describe myself. And it was people like you. I've had amazing mentors and people at these conferences and people who have taken me under their wing and said, we want to see you succeed. We're not better because we know something that you don't. We want to teach you. So now I'm the princess toadstool that flies. She picks up onions and hucks them at people. But the big thing that she is, she's part of a team, a team to accomplish a goal. So when we look at the evolution of princesses over time, in the past, you may have seen a princess as somebody who was a girl who wore a crown, who would inherit a throne, who might be whiny, but that is not what a princess is. And it's because we can change how princesses are perceived, and everyone in this room can be a DevOps princess. So I want to talk about some princesses that embrace the traits of what I see a DevOps princess as, which is everyone here and slides that sometimes don't always move, but that's okay, because we'll get there. So we'll just start with Mulan. Okay, well, she was daring. Now we have, <laughs> we have Belle. Belle was empowering. She was very smart. She had all this knowledge, but she shared it. She taught the beast. She mentored him to make him better. She shared that knowledge. We also have Cinderella. She'll come up here in a minute. Oh, sorry, this is Fiona. Fiona, she saw value in herself and value in others. She didn't care if you had green skin or if you were a talking donkey. Cinderella, eternally optimistic. I mean, that girl had some stuff happen to her. Well, anyway, she was optimistic. Birds sang. She, you know, her dreams came true. Ariel, she was purpose-driven. She wanted to learn what a fork was, what feet did. So she left the environment that she was comfortable in and went and learned new things. And then Merida. Merida was strong. She was set to be married off. She didn't want to be. So instead, she took her bow and arrow, went out, did the things that she wanted to do. And because of that, her mother did not live as a bear, which was a really good thing. So... DevOps princess, somebody who's daring, empowering, sees value in themselves, value in others, is optimistic, purpose-driven, and strong. And that is what this community has shown me it, that a DevOps princess is. And you can all, again, go out there and be a DevOps princess, not just for yourself, but for others. And I had great DevOps princesses in my life. Jennifer Davis from Chef, Nicole Forsgren from Chef, Jessica DeVita from Chef. It actually turns out you do not have to work for Chef to be a DevOps princess, though. So uh, you don't even have to be a human being. We've got Ember Dog. 
you can be a DevOps princess by how you treat others. And so I encourage everyone here to put on an actual tiara or just a mental tiara and go out there and be a DevOps princess for somebody else in your life because you change one person and you can change the world. So I'm Julie Gunderson. Thank you. We have a booth with tiaras. Feel free to come grab some. All right, thank you, Julie. Our next speaker is Justin King. Justin is gonna to talk to us about choosing a framework for your project. Okay, everyone, so I'm um, sorry. Before I start, I just wanna let you know that I had a tech glitch where I couldn't get my notes and couldn't practice them, so I have to look at this. Anyway, go on with the slides. <laughs> Going with the slides? <laughs> yeah, great. <laughs> this is only killing me. <laughs> this suspense is even worse than I thought it would be. <laughs> um, I can't really do much entertaining except for, oh, look, a squirrel. <laughs> Foreshadowing. <laughs> <laughs> still, still on slides. Okay, so let me get this straight. Oh, uh, restart. Um, you didn't put a full screen, so can you restart? <laughs> fine, fine. Okay, I'll have to go to that page of notes. Where, where the heck is that? Ah, <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> okay, so th there's this thing called a tool. It um, how do I put this? It creates objects in hardware and software. And anyway, the tool has to show early signs that it saves time for your project. If it distracts you, then it doesn't do its job efficiently. Oh, hey, look, a squirt. <laughs> I want to see the person who's in control. All right, so starting over. Okay, then. <laughs> Another reason. The last two minutes did not happen. <laughs> All right, so our next speaker is Justin King. Justin is going to talk to us tonight about choosing a framework for your project. Justin. <clears throat> That's not actually updated, it's choosing a tool. Anyway, so hello, I'm Justin, and that over there is my talk. Before I start, I want to mention that a tool, in my case, means something that you can create with hardware and software, not a project management. Anyway, so what is the official definition of a tool? It's something to create hardware or software, hopefully saves time for your project, and overall makes your project better. So, for example, what's not a tool? Something that can be used up or consumed, like lettuce over here. No, no, it's not drugs. Um, <laughs> um, however, the tool can break. Not a final product either. All right, so to find the correct tool, you need to find a tool that's reliable, appropriate for your project, and something that your project manager and you can use easily. Very important. Humor's coming. <laughs> but make sure, not, make sure not to choose the tool that is unfamiliar to you and the project manager and make sure it fits your project. If any of these bad symptoms apply, you probably shouldn't get the tool. All right, so here's the fun slide. The tool has to show early signs that it saves time for your project. It can't distract you. Huh? Oh, look, a squirrel! I told you foreshadowing. <laughs> All right, so if you misuse the tool, there's gonna be some side effects. So um, you'll get stressed. You might get distracted if you're a person like me, and you will definitely have buyer's remorse because everyone blames it on the tool. Cropped image, oh, more glitches. If you misuse a tool or buy the wrong tool, um, you're gonna have these late side effects after a couple weeks, which include being crazy. <laughs> and it's almost too late, but there are a couple things you can do. So if all is lost, then you may have to stop using the tool. Duh. You may have to get rid of it or just make it so that you're not using it. 
and you have to think of another way to do your project without the tool, and then redo it. So you have to have help from other people if you're going to actually get the right tool and stick with it, because you, can't just, you just can't do it alone. You need help from the pros also. You're going to get carried away if you don't. All right. Your tool needs to be set up fast, otherwise you'll get very tired and have a lot of stress and get distracted. You need to look at the manual first. So after 15 minutes of stress, take a five minute break. 30 minutes of stress, get help from a professional. <laughs> when I say worrying the slide, I definitely mean very concerned. So your tool needs to be timely, otherwise it doesn't prove its worth and it won't meet your deadline. You'll have to dump it and do it without. Okay, so let me explain the slide. If you screw up your, pan your project with the tool, you're going to panic, you're going to get stressed, you're going to need outside help, and you're definitely going to have to redo everything your tool broke. Not fun. Okay, so these are my personal times, they're average times. So that's um, completing a whole project with a tool. Now let me explain. For example, a knife project's time depends on whether you're cutting a sandwich in half or carving a sculpture. So that's why it's such variable. Anyway, the process of using the tool. No matter what you think, does the tool save you time? Does it bring smiles to the workplace? Does it feed all your pets and do all your chores? Does it bring world peace? Oh, sorry, got carried away. Anyway, so, another glitch. If the tool saves you time, then you should probably keep it. If it doesn't, you should set it aside or get rid of it. Yep, LibreOffice glitch for sure. It's false, it shouldn't do that. Anyway, so, so raise your hand, just any one of you, I'll pick a random one, if you know what either of the tools do. And sorry about that last one. All right, you. Uh, well, anyway, that's odd glue gun, if you were wondering. Anyway, so yeah, that's an XKCD phone. As you can see, a whole bunch of weird features. 350 pixels per screen? I'd hope so. Anyway, to summarize, <clears throat> I was talking about any tool used to create something hardware or software in this presentation. I really do like cats. <laughs> and the tools have to be reliable, save time, and do a whole bunch of other things that I discussed. <laughs> anyway, so here's my contact info if you want to know more. Justin King, justinscottking at gmail.com, Babu on IRC. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Justin. All right, our final speaker is Corey Quinn. How many people remember Corey's upscale talk from last year? Drinking for sysadmins. All right, so Corey really loves Docker. <laughs> You've all heard of Docker because the first rule of Docker is never shut the fuck up about Docker. <laughs> So I'm going to tell you all a story instead. It's called, That Time My Boss Destroyed a Cubicle. It was almost 10 years ago, and I'd been at this company for a year. Uh, they brought a new boss in. It was his first week. He was looking forward to making a strong impression. Don't worry, he did. So he's dressing to the nines, which, respect. He was being very polite. He was being very managerial. and. One morning, I heard something across the cubicle from me that I'd never heard before in an office environment. Shooka, 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 shooka. Poof! <laughs> that seems a little on the strange side. So, I prairie dogged over the side of the cubicle, and what did I see? But, well, in order to understand what I saw, you have to understand what caused it first. Now, it turns out that in his effort of continuous self-improvement, my boss was doing a slim fast diet, and he was also caffeinating heavily. So you have slim fast powder. We're going to mix the two and shake it. Turns out that when you mix slim fast with coffee, it generates pressure rapidly. <laughs> all over his shirt, all over his keyboard, all over his laptop. And when I left the company a year later, it would st they still had the blast radius everywhere. It was hilarious. So what's the point you're wondering? Why would I possibly bring up a story about the time misusing a container led to disaster and horrible situations? 
My name is Corey Quinn, and the name of this talk is Docker Must Die, Heresy in the Church of Docker. Originally, this talk was called Docker is Horseshit. The organizers asked me to change it. Once I did, they asked if I wouldn't mind changing it back. So, we all know how the sausage gets made. Developers write code. They throw it over the wall to operations, and thank goodness it's someone else's problem now. Life goes on. Except from an operations perspective, it's not that simple. Docker has taken this model and extended it a bit further, specifically using the shipping container analogy. Developers worry about what's inside, and operations takes it from port on uh, rail, on, uh, on uh, tractor trailers, but somewhere along here we forgot to build roads. See, once upon a time we had a three-tier architecture and environments, web servers, application servers, and database servers. You knew what was in all three of those tiers, and placement was deterministic. You understood what was going on. Unfortunately, with Docker, the architecture deepens a little bit. Containers are non-deterministically placed. You don't necessarily know where a particular instance is going to live. And you really don't quite know where something is going to wind up orchestrated into next. But slow down there, hasty pudding. I'm not done. See, you can't run this stuff on your existing bare metal systems without some serious work because the Docker orchestration system expects to be able to control its environment through a series of API calls. Enter OpenStack. This is an actual OpenStack architecture diagram. This is why I drink so frequently. <laughs> So the problem you have is this giant level of complexity on top of another giant level of complexity, at which point you wind up in a situation where you don't have the ability to hold it all in your head. So when it breaks, or God forbid, someone tells you it's slow, where do you begin? Where do you even start to troubleshoot this sort of thing? Please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying never use Docker. If you're doing something like Twitter for pets that I personally don't give a shit if it breaks, please use Docker. You're not going to break anything I care about. But if you're doing something that touches critical infrastructure, could we not? A conversation I never want to have is 911 emergency response. Could you please hold? We're having some trouble with Kubernetes. Well, have you tried restarting the master and minion communication? It, it likes to break sometimes. I never want to have that conversation, and hopefully I won't have to. I'm not saying never use new and interesting technologies. What I am saying is think a little bit about how you're using it, what the failure cases are, and whether the trade-offs justify the complexity you're bringing. I remember a time we could think about the, the environment and hold the entire state in our heads. I remember a time when this stuff was simpler, and I remember a time when this puppy's chocolate-covered fur was white. If you've enjoyed this talk, please come on Sunday to my Terrible Ideas and Git talk where I give a live demo using Docker. <laughs> there we go. All right, thank you, Corey. One more round of applause for all of our upscale speakers. All right, we're going to take a few minutes to set up for bad voltage. The bar is open, so please help yourself to a drink if you have a drink ticket. If not, there should be people floating around handing them out. <laughs> 